a pleasure for me to have the opportunity to give this talk and I thank the organizer for inviting me and you all for listening. I will introduce you on a topic related to the specificity of a natural origin material with peculiar characteristics. Always fascinating human being in a millennia, silk. In this presentation, I will tell you about a research mainly done by Dr. Alessio Cucciarelli during his doctorate activity, supervised by me, with the help of professors Antonella Motta and Alberto Guaranta from the University of Trento and Van Siegel Valli from the Virginia Commonwealth University and from the biological experiments adjuvated by Dr. Silvia Chiera, she also from the University of Trento. Silk fibrine is the major component of silk. It is a structural protein responsible for the excellent mechanical properties of the silk filament. Going beyond the uses for textiles, silk fibrin is generally isolated from the silk wire, dismantling the overall supramolecular and intramolecular structure until unfolding the protein and solubilizing it into a solvent, usually water. This permits its use as a raw material for building up structures that find use in different fields, from tissue engineering to drug delivery which makes silk fibrine one of the most interesting biomaterials in the current scenario. Silk fibrine can be recast into different shapes, like films, hydrogels, foams, micro and nanofibers or tubes, characterized by large tunable properties, excellent biocompatibility and biodegradability, versatile functionalization and generally optimal interaction with living tissue. Among the derivable materials, the possibility of building large monoliths was still missing. Some attempts have been done in recent time from Marello et al., starting from the idea of solution casting that allowed obtaining large monoliths. The two main limits of this technique were the large shape deformation due to the shrinkage caused by the water evaporation and the excessively long process time, since the complete evaporation can last from several days to several weeks, depending on the dimension of the monoliths. Missing in this scenario was an alternative method for fast fabricating silk fibrine monoliths, starting from dry fibrine without using of harsh chemicals and high temperatures. This because a possible translation to an industrial process should imply objects production in minutes, the removal of potential toxic chemicals, increasing the overall ecological impact, and finally, the use of low temperatures that permit the embedding of thermosensitive bioactive molecules such as enzymes or drugs. A low temperature called sintering of silk fibrine which is the procedure I'm going to describe, has been reported in a paper available on advanced functional materials. As first attempt, we started from the dry fibroin obtained by lyophilizing the protein solution and just tried to simply compress it into a metal mold, hoping that a sufficient pressure could trigger the sinterization. Unlucky, the procedure unless coadjuvated by high temperatures, higher than 120 degrees Celsius, permitted us to obtain just a compressed powder instead of a sintered structure. We decided then to modify our approach and try using water as a plasticizer. We introduced a further step in the process constituted of the hydration of the dry silk flakes for a short period in a closed humidity saturated chamber. Only by hydrating the silk powder with water for a few minutes, the material could be easily sintered, turning from a wide compressed power to a continuous semi-transparent chip. The process was studied setting up a design of experiment using two observable physical properties as indicator of the material transformation. 
the change in the optical transparency measured as the optical transmittance in the 400-800 nanometer range and the change in the mechanical properties measured as the increase of the young compression modulus. Factors studied in the model were the maximum pressure applied to the mold, the ramp time, that is the time to reach the maximum applied pressure, the time the mold is kept under pressure, and the percentage of the water added. These four factors have been then combined to build up an equation containing the weighted contribution of the proportional terms and all the combination of the mixed terms, then evaluated against the experimental values of light absorbance and elastic modulus. Analyzing the absorbance values against the addition of water and maintaining time, it resulted clear that the dry material was incapable of granting low absorbance levels. Among the samples exposed to water instead, those showing higher transparency were the ones maintained under pressure for longer time. Given these conditions, the shortest ramp time, 120 seconds, and the highest pressure applied, 400 MPa, resulted in the most transparent samples in which all the fibrin flakes were sintered in a continuous thermoplastic material. Similar results were obtained analyzing the values of the young modulus calculated from the compression curves and which was expected to be maximized in the case of complete sintering. These conditions could be obtained with a low ramp time, a high pressure, low maintenance time and with the presence of added water, corresponding to the maximum young models values of about 1100 megapascal in dry condition. To try and describe the physical mechanism at the base of the transition, we have evaluated the protein secondary structures forming during the process, analyzed through infrared analysis and picked the convolution of the amide 1 region. We decided to compare the transition after sintering of dry flakes and hydrated flakes for short 30 minutes and long time, 12 hours. We analyzed just after lyophilization. When analyzed just after lyophilization, the flakes appeared having very low crystallinity levels, with very low levels of antiparallel and stable beta sheets, which rise from about 5 to 9% when exposed to water vapor for 30 minutes. When exposed for 12 hours instead, beta sheet content rised to almost 36% and the overall stable beta contributions, parallel and antiparallel, to almost 45%. After sintering, the sample exposed for 30 minutes to water could maintain the contribution of stable beta sheet low, while sample sintered after 12 hours moisting didn't change significantly the overall crystalline structure and resulted completely not sintered. This analysis permitted could to confirm that a low initial crystallinity is crucial for the process to occur at low temperature and that the presence of water is capable of plasticizing fibrin, permitting the thermal reflow. However, since water is responsible of triggering the transition to better structures, the sintering has to be performed before the transition occurring and, possibly, with fast run time, as previously evidenced by transparency. The effect of the optimized compression process was also observed by SEM micrographs at different time points. Just after the pre-compression, at 40 seconds and 80 seconds, and at the end of the process, 120 seconds. The black arrows indicates the direction of the compression detectable from the stratified structure formed during the process. In particular, the pressure planes are perpendicular to the compression direction, with flow lines visible and evidencing low temperature reflow occurring. 
These structures can be clearly recognized in the precompressed material and in the first time point at low magnification. At higher magnification, column 2, we can observe the viscous flow occurring, the formation of ripples at 40 seconds and their flow 80 seconds, forming a compact material 120 seconds. The flow is visible also at a higher magnification, where the material seems to be in sort of a melted state. After 120 seconds, the material results to be compact with typical microstructure of a brittle fracture. The biological response of the fibrin material resulting from the sintering was finally compared to the behavior of similar geometry samples prepared by mold casting of polycaprolactin. An FDA approved degradable material largely proposed for bone tissue engineering applications. Samples were evaluated using confocal microscopy, capturing images of adhered adipose derived mesenchymal stem cells at different time points on both types of samples at three different magnification, evidencing cell cytoskeletal morphology, green and nuclei, blue staining. From confocal images, we could observe a general and homogeneous cell distribution on both surface samples along time points. However, at day 5 it is possible to observe that, even though the PCL surface samples present higher cell density, the cell shape resulted elongated, indicated that cell-to-cell -cell interactions are more focused among cells than the cell-to-sample surface. On the other hand, on low temperature sintered fibrin samples, cell shape is more extended, indicated that the interaction between cells and sample surface is higher, promoting a greater degree of spreading. This behavior can indicate that since low temperature sintered fibrin samples are made of protein, their surfaces offer more additional sites to cells improving the mechanism of interaction between cells and surface. This holds great potential in the design of a microscale scaffold for various tissue engineering applications. As conclusion, I hope to have demonstrated you the possibility of optimizing a fast, low temperature method to obtain large monolith of solid fibering, reporting for the first time a thermal reflow at 40 degrees for lyophilized silk fibrin. We could evidence the key role of the absorbed water vapor during the compression phase and the fact that it is in competition with the self-reorganization of silk fibrin secondary structure. We strongly believe that large-scale solid fibrin objects produced with this method can find application in implantable bioresorbable devices particularly when one issue still present in the obtained material will be resolved. I'm referring to the drastic reduction of the young modulus observed when the sintered material is exposed to simulated physiological fluids. Young modulus values, in this case, dropped from a maximum of 1100 MPa when dry to a low 200 MPa in physiological conditions and caused by water absorbed and acting as plasticizer inside the material. This fact could strongly limit some application in bone tissue engineering, especially when load bearing is required. For this reason, we are currently focusing on an escape strategy consisting in the use of a low toxicity cross-linker, water and temperature activated capable of enhancing mechanical properties while preserving cell viability. The first results of this work are at the moment submitted for review and will be possibly available soon to the scientific community. One last slide to acknowledge my co-workers, Dr. Alessio Bucciarelli, main experimental executor and together with me, inventor and designer of the process, Professors Alberto Quaranta, Ramsia de Valli and Antonella Motta, supervisors of the physical and biological experiments, and Silvia Chiera, executor of these lasts. 
a video showing the evidence of the processability of the sintered silk fiber in monoliths here shaped as gears using a simple commercial laser cutting machine. This picture reports light yellow samples made of broad fibery together with black samples that are instead both sintered and cross-linked fibery. Thank you for your attention.